Welcome everyone. We're going to give folks a few minutes to join. Just give everyone another minute. Natalie, a name for the pet? This is my dog, Oscar. Oscar, nice and to meet a, Oscar. He's a boxer. He's very cute. <laughs> I like that. I like that you had that immediately available, Natalie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ask me for a picture of my husband. I need search, but it's <laughs> always there. If anyone wants 10,000 cat photos, I <laughs> have. <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So, Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Rachel Sandberg, the Scholarly Communication Officer and Program Director um, at UC Berkeley. And we've got a great panel discussion lined up for you today. Just to orient us, the, the purpose of today's session is to understand the open access book publishing process, including how to pursue publishing an open access book, um, what choices authors and editors make, and what the impact of publishing an open access book really is. We'll be using the UC Berkeley Library's open access book agreement with Springer Nature as some context for this discussion. So about one year ago, our library entered into a first of its kind institutional open access book publishing agreement with Springer Nature. The agreement provides funding so that UC Berkeley scholarly authors with Springer contacts or contracts may publish a book under open access terms. And the books are published with a Creative Commons attribution license, which means that readers around the world will be able to freely and immediately read online, download, and reuse the books. With research showing that open access books are downloaded 10 times more often and cited nearly two and a half times more, um, we think this ag agreement will significantly enhance the visibility, dissemination, and impact of important Berkeley academic research. The UC Berkeley Springer Nature OA Books Agreement covers a broad range of book titles across all disciplines from humanities and social sciences to sciences, technology, medicine, and math. Um, and our agreement runs for three years and covers books published under, under the Springer, Palgrave, and APROS imprints. Several UC Berkeley authored or edited books have already been published open access via this agreement, including um, a gender and women's studies book called Complicities, a theory for subjectivity in the psychological humanities, an electrical engineering and computer sciences book entitled Probability in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and an education book entitled, entitled Life Skills um, Education for Youth. And there are more open access titles that are going to be published later this year. So why did we enter into this agreement? Um, well, advancing knowledge is core to the mission of the university. And as doing that, as part of doing that, our faculty, researchers, and students create and share their scholarship. It's the amount of around 9% of all scholarly journal articles published in the United States and around 2% of global publishing. But more pertinent for today's discussion is that we know that not all UC authors are publishing journal articles. And many disciplines, such as arts and humanities and social sciences, focus on the scholarly book as the preferred method of publishing. In contrast with journal articles, 
books typically cost significantly more to produce. And that's where the UC Berkeley Springer Open Access Book Agreement comes in by dedicating funds to ensure that UC Berkeley authored Springer books can be published open access from the get-go. So now it's time to turn to understanding the book publishing process, including the steps and considerations for open access book publishing. And to help us answer these questions, we're joined by three panelists. Ralph Gerstner is the executive editor for computer science with Springer Heidelberg. He's been with Springer for 21 years after having spent 10 years in the computer industry with companies like SAP, Symbolics, and Siemens. He has commissioned about 20 open access and hundreds of non-open access books for Springer, funded by various European and US-based institutions. Ralph will be answering questions about the book proposal and publishing process generally. We also have Molly Beck, who is executive editor for literature at Palgrave Macmillan, an imprint of Springer Nature that specializes in the humanities and social sciences. She's been at Palgrave for six years and has commissioned a number of open access books in literature and history. Molly will be answering questions specifically about selecting and choosing open access as a publishing option. And finally, Edward Curry is the established professor of data science and the director of both the Science Foundation Ireland Insight Research Center for Data Analytics, as well as the Data Science Institute at the National University of Ireland in Galway. He has authored or co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed scientific publications and has recently published six open access books with Springer Nature. Professor Curry's research has received numerous awards and invitations to speak at several leading research organizations and venues, including UC Berkeley, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Dagstuhl. Since 2010, Professor Curry has acquired more than 4 million in euros in funding to establish and expand his research, and he serves as an expert for industry and the public sector, including the European Commission. His two most recent Springer open access books are The Elements of Big Data Value and Real-Time Linked Data Spaces, and he has two more currently in production. Professor Curry will be answering questions about his personal publishing process and why he chose open access and how it's going for him. And I will just say that anyone who has any questions, please feel free to put them in chat and we'll be able to get to them at the end of the session. Um, and they're, they're going to be monitored by our colleagues, so we will definitely answer them at the end. But first, I'm going to turn to Ralph to kick, to kick us off. Um, so Ralph, can you give us an overview of Springer Nature Books? What sort of books does the press publish? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, of, I have to start with, of course, I know best the computer science program because I'm responsible in computer science. But I can, uh, for example, show you uh, just some sample books. Uh, if I just checking that you get my screen. Let me quickly see where it is. Uh, this one over here. So you should see here three books uh, that were published in computer science. And uh, you see very well also the number of downloads. Uh, and uh, for example, there's one from Ed Curry who has joined us this evening or to this day. Sorry for me, for me, it's the evening. Um, and uh, this was actually his first open access book on new horizons for a data-driven economy. It was published now six years ago and it has basically seen 700,000 chapter downloads, which is really a huge success. And it uh, just highlights uh, the importance or the benefits of publishing open access and the high download figures because there is no barrier for potential readers to actually access the book. Another example from the computer science department is this one here in the middle. Uh, it was only published this year on digital humanism from a computer science perspective. And as you can see, it has already 110,000 chapter downloads just within two or three months. Uh, this is uh, really fantastic. And the, the third one here is one from information retrieval. Also, you see here almost 200,000 chapter downloads basically in three years. This again highlights the benefits of publishing open access. So, if you don't mind, uh, I would now continue with um, explaining the general process of uh, how you 
come to a publication. Uh, to this end, I will just uh, show you this slide here that uh, summarizes basically the open, not only the open access process, but really the, I dare say, the general pro process of publishing with Springer. Um, we suppose that in this case, the contact comes from the author's side. I can add later on a couple of words what may change if we initiate a contact, but uh, I think to start with, it's probably easier to assume that the author has developed an idea for a book and uh, now basically wants to find out where and how to publish it. And uh, from our perspective, the starting point is always writing a proposal. A proposal means you should write for us some overview. Usually in computer science, it's about three to five pages where you explain the aims and goals of the book, the intended target audience, which means for whom do you actually write um, to relate the book to other books on the topic that may already be on the market. So you need to highlight what's so specific about your book and how your book will differ from other books on the market because uh, that's our common goal. Both you and us, we both want, of course, that the book will be read, sold, used. And this is the easier if your book has something specific and is, sorry to say this, not just the 10,000 book on C++ or on the C programming language. I mean, no one is interested to really publish just another book on C or Java when there are already several hundred or even several thousand available. And I mean, you can easily check how many books there are that may be uh, in comparison with yours. You simply go to Amazon and type in the book title yeah? and then you'll immediately get a list of, I dare say several hundred, for example, Java or C books. Yeah? Then, so please write what's so specific about your book. And of course, also write what you expect from the reader. So which prerequisites he has to fulfill, which means is it a textbook and to start from the very beginning or is it a specialized research monograph where, for example, you already assume that your readers are largely uh, comfortable with current research and you just highlight your own things. So this is something you should make clear in the proposal for us. Of course, it's also helpful if you add a few lines about yourself, because this will also help us. And based on such a proposal, we will then internally discuss the proposal, which means I will discuss it in computer science with my computer science colleagues. I will discuss it with people from sales and marketing to get an idea how we can best promote the book. And of course, we will have it reviewed by other people from the field, which are, for example, potential readers or other researchers, because we wanna make sure that if we publish the book, it's actually meeting the requirements of the community, yeah? because this is what makes a book attractive, both for the reader and for you as the author, because the author will get a reputation from writing the book. Once we have collected sufficient feedback, we'll get back to you with our assessment and with potential say things that might need an update or might need need to be changed or to be added and we will discuss this and then come together to a decision and hopefully to the decision to publish the book yeah? and if so if we agree that the book makes sense in the say in the format and in the shape that we have designed together, then we'll make a contract and then we'll provide you for actually writing, for the writing process with uh, some uh, template formats and information so that you can actually already get a rough idea what the final book may look like once it is actually published. 
This is also helpful for us because we need to know, for example, how large your book will actually be. Will it be, say, 200 pages or will it be 600 pages? And of course, this also depends on the formatting. We also give you a number of hints what to have in mind, for example, with respect uh, to the quality of figures that you include with copyrights of foreign figures or um, photographs that you may want to reuse so that uh, you can work, say, we hope with the information that you really need. Of course, if you have any additional questions that come up over time or which you don't find in all the material that we provide, we are always there for you to support you. Usually your editor with whom you establish the contact will be available for these questions. One day, hopefully around the date that we originally arranged, your manuscript is ready and you are basically, you feel comfortable in delivering it to us. We will then have it reviewed uh, this can be on a formal basis. It can also be, especially for research monographs, on a content basis, which means we will have it again reviewed by other researchers to make sure, for example, that there are no errors in there or that uh, the reading path follows uh, a certain logic that's understood by the audience. All these issues are dealt with during the review. It may be that uh, you need to apply some revisions, yeah? usually smaller ones, but could also be that, for example, the reviewers may say, oh, I'm missing um, a section on a certain topic that's also related to this. Why should this not be added? Then, of course, we'll tell you exactly this feedback and we'll discuss if it makes sense, for example, that you say may write for another two months to have something added about the missing topic. Finally, the book is done from your perspective and we start with the production process, which means we may check the language that uh, there are no obvious errors in there. This might of course not be an issue for most Americans, I dare say, but uh, have in mind we're publishing from all over the world and there are other countries where less people speak English and where this is actually helpful and appreciated. Of course, we will also check the formatting, may apply some changes because as we will publish the book, both electronically and in print at the same time, we have to make sure that both representations can easily be read. So this is also the job of our production department. They will make sure that the final layout will fit in our book formats and in the electronic format that we use. And then usually after, I dare say, three to five months, depending on the, say, on the, on what's needed on our side during production, the book is actually published. To be frank, the ebook is usually published a bit earlier than the printed one. I dare say about one to two weeks, because that's the time we will actually need for printing and delivering the book into shops. Yeah? But it's not needed for the e-version, of course. Yet once the book is available, then of course we will promote and uh, sell the book worldwide. And this really means not only in the US or in Europe, but basically in every country in the world. And uh, of course you you get a regular information from our side, how well the book sells, what uh, say how many readers you will have. You can check online on our book catalog page, how many downloads there were. So for example, for the three books that I had just presented, you can check yourself that I don't distribute any fake news about the downloads. Yeah, I just downloaded these figures today. So they should be, I dare say almost the same if you look yourself now. And that's, actually what we do during the publication process. Now, you might be interested, what's different if I do an open access book? And uh, actually, there's not much difference because what counts first for us is the quality and the content. So uh, don't be 
say, misled by the impression that by uh, paying some kind of uh, publication fee or open access fee, you can buy a publication. That's not our business. If we publish a book, we are convinced that it is of interest for the community and we publish at our own risk. So this is, I think this is very important because sometimes people misunderstand and think they can actually, if they just offer enough money, then we'll publish it. That's not true. We'll publish because we are convinced of the content. And the difference is only in how people can access the content later on. Yeah, I mean, for if you go the traditional way, the reader has to pay if he wants to access. Whereas if you go open access, the electronic download is for free. And uh, you can also, the, the reader can also buy the book, the uh, open access book. In this case, it has a reduced price compared to a non-open access book. But uh, say the main advantages, and from our experience, most readers at universities or in large companies, meanwhile, read electronically, and there the access is fully free. And that's basically the, the open access and the traditional publishing process. So that's, uh, that's for my side, I dare say. That is really helpful. I, I have one quick follow-up question. Um, so is it the print hard copy version that would be at a reduced cost if the book was also published open access for the digital version for free? Yes, yes, that's it. Okay. If, the, if you publish open access, this means the digital version is for free and the print okay. version has a reduced and fixed price. Got it. Um, okay, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what advice you would give to early career researchers so that they'll be ready to publish uh, Wishbringer Nature books. Mm. I think the, the first thing is when you start your career and think about writing, you have to go one step after the other. So uh, you cannot expect if you're just starting your PhD, for example, that you will write a textbook that can be used worldwide in, in hundreds of classes. Yeah? So I dare say there is like, I dare say like in any other job as well, there is a certain path that you, and you climb one step after the other. Yeah? And this means usually you start with publication in journals, or at renowned conferences. And then at some point in time, you may have collected enough material to think, for example, about the monograph that summarizes your work and puts it into perspective with the work of others. As a next step, you may enlarge this and say, okay, it's not only my own research that I can cover, I can cover a larger part. Then you, it's probably again a monograph but uh, say on a, with a wider view. You may also, if you develop further, you may think about editing a book, which means you probably have already some reputation in the community for being successful with respect to a certain topic. The topic is probably still developing or enlarging. And you may say, okay, there's a specific topic I'm especially interested in. I know I can't cover this myself, not even sure if anyone can cover it alone. So let's go for an edited work. Yeah? And then you may invite others uh, to join you to bring say the combined knowledge of a set of people in an edited volume. And next step again might be, you're already in the business for quite some time. You have uh, taught about the topic. Yeah, you have had the uh, say, dozens, hundreds, thousands of students that already followed your classes and your explanations. And you think about, well, I've done this now three or four or five times. I think I could write a book because it might help you and me when I teach the class next time. I mean, probably I can start easier because I can refer to the book or others may use the book as well. And you may then consider writing a textbook. Yeah, so. Uh, I think this is very important. Do one step after the other. Don't start at the high end, yeah? Just some, but uh, 
think where you are, what you can do, what you do best, where you're known for. And this is the type of book that may then fit you. Any last advice or tips you want to share before we head over to Molly? I don't know. Maybe if someone has a question, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, well, we, we can get those at, yeah. the, at the end. But OK, then I, I think for the time, I think uh, I've said what I think is important, but I, of course, may have forgotten something or not be clear enough. Then please ask and I will try later on to answer it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Very much. So Molly, can you tell us about the open access book publishing program at Springer Nature, how it works? Um, Ralph mentioned a little bit about payment. I, I was wondering if you could explain how payment works and why and what the differences are for authors between publishing under open access and, and in print. Yeah, sure. I actually put together just a brief kind of overview slide that I will have in the background while I'm speaking. So let me just pop that up first. Um, just a moment. There we go. So this um, outlines a few of the points that um, I'll raise in, in answer to that question. Um, so as, as Ralph already said, we, we publish open access books across all of the subject areas that we commission in at Springer Nature. Um, so from, from the science and medicine side of things uh, to the social sciences and humanities, which is the area in which I work. And actually I work for Palgrave Macmillan as well, um, rather than the Springer imprint. Um, so if there's time at the end, I'm also happy to answer questions about the differences between the two. And if anyone has any HSS related questions about submitting a proposal, um, I'm very happy uh, to discuss if there's any differences. Although I think for in large part, it's similar to, to what Ralph outlined um, for computer science. Um, so I think, I think the first thing to say is that our open access publishing model is a gold open access publishing model, uh, which means that the ebook is free to access from the point of publication. So you might see other um, discussions about open access talking about green OA, which is when there's an embargo period. Um, there's other models that um, are being pioneered actually in the journals side of things. Um, but gold is what we offer for our books. Uh, and we offer, uh, we make the ebook available across all of the different uh, types of ebook that we publish. So that's the PDF and the EPUB and the HTML formats. Um, it's worth actually keeping an eye on that if you are thinking about which publisher to go with, because some presses will make the PDF available on publication under their gold open access, under their open access offering. Um, so what we do is, is it really goes and covers all of the different ways that readers could want to come and read your book. Um, and those book, the ebook is available on Springer Link, which is our ebook library platform. But you can also find it on lots of other platforms. So that includes um, Amazon, Google Books, um, Mobi. Uh, all of our books, our open access books are published under a Creative Commons license. And we, we like to use the CCBY license, which is the most open uh, license. Uh, but there's a few different uh, uh, options that you can choose. And that's really worth discussing with your editor and making sure that you understand what is meant by CCBY. Essentially, CCBY allows for the fullest sharing and reuse of the work. Um, so your work can be built upon and reused and shared to the broadest possible readership. Um, in terms of payment, so how it actually really works, uh, authors and or the book editors or actually more likely their funders pay a book processing charge. So this is a fee that is fixed uh, for the book, for the type of book. Uh, it depends, the fee is on a sliding scale depending on how long the book is. So very long books might have a higher fee just to reflect the higher production costs that go into it. Um, if you are lucky enough to be at Berkeley, you benefit from our special partnership deal. So uh, I won't go into the actual fees just because I think it might get a bit confusing. Um, but the BPC really covers all of the costs related to producing your book. So that includes the commissioning, the proofreading, the editorial input that you get from us in-house, 
um, all of the uh, work that goes into producing the book and then disseminating it, promoting it, making sure it really is available as widely as possible um, and supporting you through all, all of that. Um, in order, to, in order to kind of firm everything up, there's a special open access contract and a service agreement which outlines the fee and the license under which your book will publish. Um, so there's a, a sort of different procedural um, contract from our usual books, but it's really, it's a very similar process. Great. Um, so are there any disciplinary differences you observe about open access book publishing for the sciences versus HSS, which you're involved with? Yeah, I mean, I think while I'm solely responsible for commissioning in the humanities and, and my, my direct experience has been in, in history and literature, um, there is a group of us that meet regularly at Springer Nature and we talk about our different experiences as editors. Um, I think it's true to say that different disciplines have have come to um, OA at different speeds and also with different expectations and requirements. So I know that some STM authors will have had more experience of publishing open access journal articles than some of their counterparts in the humanities where book publishing is really the gold standard. Um, the level of funding also differs considerably, but that isn't just even across subject areas, but even within sub-disciplines. Um, I think in my own, there's a lot of funding for uh, anything where literature crosses over with the hard sciences, so literature and medicine or literature and the environment, but not so much for other kind of more canonical or traditional areas. Um, I think as well, I know from my own experience that HSS authors are often concerned about the accessibility of their books through traditional means too. So that print edition of the book that Ralph mentioned is really important to my authors because a lot of the time they still love reading the print book. They want to know that just because the work is open access, they'll still have that copy that they can hold and show off and, and rightly feel very proud of. Um, and I think the other thing to note actually as well is that there's, there's a number of regional differences in the speeds at which um, open access has been taken up as well. Uh, and, and the speed at which certain areas of the world even can take, an, take up open access options too. Actually, I wanna pick up on one thing you just mentioned about um, the desire to have the print copy um, often can be a misconception about publishing open access that um, it would mean you don't have a print copy available or that um, there's no possibility of royalties for, for print copies. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what you see in talking to authors about potentially publishing open access. What are some of their misconceptions and, and what do you wish they knew about publishing open access? Yeah, um, so I think I think the biggest misconception is actually something that Ralph touched on earlier, which is that uh, open access books are not peer reviewed um, or that it's somehow easier to publish open access because, I mean, you, you can understand you're coming forward with this, this nice sum of money to pay the publisher to publish your work. Um, so I think the main the main misconception is that we don't peer review. We do to the same um, standard that we publish the rest of our program. And so it's really important to us that our open access books actually, in fact, by being so much more visible, it, it's it's all that much more important to us that they really are the very highest quality. Um, and in many cases, because there is that additional review process that goes through either with the University of Berkeley or with whichever funding institution that has is funding the research, the books are almost more rigorous sometimes um, in how many uh, stages of review the author has already been through. Um, I think the print copy is another misconception. Uh, you raised an interesting point about royalties. Um, I mean, I think if I'm trying to, and I was trying to think of disadvantages to publishing open access before this talk, uh, to be completely frank, uh, I think the only downside to publishing your book open access as opposed to non-OA is that we do not pay authors any remuneration or royalties on their open access book. Um, so that means no fee on publication, no advance, no royalties. Um, and that's really because the book processing charge takes into account all of the costs that go into producing the book. Um, I mean, for most academic texts, the level of financial remuneration you can expect to receive is fairly modest. Uh, so 
on the whole, we find that authors are understanding of this and also funders are also understanding of this. I think most of the time funders would prefer to get a discount on the uh, book processing charge than pay the author a royalty. So that that's why we've taken this decision and that's kind of how the um, book processing charge is being calculated as well. So I think if you are if you are looking to write a more popular book that you hope will sell in in print in in the thousands, open access probably isn't for you. But for most other scholarly purposes, it's a really it's a really good option. And the only other thing I'd say is that I I think authors are just often surprised by just how well their books do perform at open access, and they're thrilled to see how many people around the world have been able to download their book. And they hear from they hear from people who they never would have expected. So whether that's in the social sciences, often it's it's people working at NGOs or in um, in positions where they can really make a difference. And to know that their book or, or book is reaching that audience is is a huge benefit. That actually segues really well into my last question, which is kind of if you could assess how the whole open access book publishing program is going at Springer. Um, what the hurdles have been, opportunities for growth, or just how you see the next few years playing out? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're all really pleased by the progress that we've been seeing so far. So I think as a company together, our first OA book publication was in 2011. So we are uh, over 10 years into this, um, and we've now published over 1,500 OA books. Um, with over 200 million chapter downloads since 2013. And I'm sure someone in the OA team will tell me that that's already out of date. Um, I think it's it's one of the fastest changing and it's also one of the most exciting topics in publishing. Uh, so that comes with its challenges as well. Um, there's an increasing number of funders, institutions, other national research bodies that are pushing for research to be made more freely accessible. Um, as a standard. And so I think one of the one of the things that we really notice at Springer Nature, where we have a very active journals publishing program as well as books, is that um, our journals colleagues are often much more advanced in these discussions uh, than we are. But books are part of the conversations that are happening. And they're so different for all the reasons that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that there's a lot of work going on to figure out exactly how we can create a sustainable future for open access publishing. Um, funding is, is, is the key challenge, um, how, who pays, how it's paid, how it's organized. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting work going on and, and not just at Springer Nature, but in conversation with presses around the world and libraries around the world too. Good. Any parting thoughts before we move on? Um, I don't think about the open access um, program. I was just going to say as well, if anyone has questions about the um, about publishing in humanities and social sciences, so Palgrave is the um, company that is the imprint that publishes solely in the humanities and social sciences, and we've got editors working across every subject area. Springer also has a number of humanities and social sciences editors, uh, but if you are interested, we have pages on our website that outline all of the different areas that editors um, commission in and uh, feel free to email me and I can put you in touch with the person who is most suited to your project as well. Great, thank you so much, Molly. Um, so turning to you, Edward, um, you published your book, The Elements of Big Data Value in 2021 and Real-Time Linked Data Spaces in 2020, Open Access Through Springer OA Books. Um, so I wanted to explore some of the same kinds of questions that I asked the editors about the process, uh, but with you, because it would be great to hear about your experience from an author's point of view. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the proposal and the proposal review process, how that worked for you, um, how you approached Springer, what, what the selection and acceptance process was, whether you negotiated your agreement, um, and why you decided to publish Open Access. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Rachel. So um, the, the, the process started for me when we had a, a project, it was actually 2015, where we had a, a research project here funded by the European Commission. And we had about 15, 16 different um, organizations working together to try to understand what are the, the challenges that we had around building a, a data-driven economy in Europe. So we had this large collaborative project 
we'd done very, very extensive studies. We had deliverables for the project that literally ran into thousands of pages of material. And what we were trying to figure out is how do you bring that big body of work into a volume that could actually be consumed by someone? Because literally thousands of pages can't be read by your average person on the street or even somebody who, who is in the field and, and would like to understand it. So the notion of a book came about as a way for us to kind of capture that large body of work um, and, and to kind of bring it down to the core messages that we wanted to communicate in, in, in the narrative kind of style. Um, and at, at the same time, open access was becoming more, more um, prevalent. And obviously our, our, our main funder, the European Commission, are very, very keen to have open access outcomes from the research projects. So for us, it kind of became a, a very positive way for us to be able to disseminate our work to reach a different audience. And that really kind of kicked it off. So it was this collaborative effort that we had and we wanted to bring it together. Um, the process was quite simple for me to, to, find, um, to find Ralph. Ralph was my editor, has been for, for all my books. Um, I went to the website and I, I filled out some details. And a few days later, Ralph got, got back to me in an email with, with many, many questions about what we were trying to do and, and what was the purpose of it. And importantly, what was the value of, of, of what this book would actually bring? Because we had these deliverables, we had the thousands of pages, they were all up there on web, uh, freely available on, on our, our project website. But we had to get across the message of what we were trying to communicate by having a, a smaller volume um, that was really focusing on the messages. So, so we, we, we had a proposal form, we filled that out, we sent it to Ralph. Ralph came back multiple times. And for every book, he's come back multiple times with feedback, telling, you know, asking the questions, where's the value? What's the difference between what you're proposing and what someone else has already done or what's already in the market? What's the value? And will this still be valuable, we'll say, in, in kind of 12 months' time when the book comes out? So there's a little bit of an interactive process there um, at the, the point of the proposal. So it's, it's trying to find the space. And I have to say, as, as books have gone on, you would have expected me to get better at the process, but uh, I still benefit from Ralph's input, even on the, the, the most latest book as well, just because he, he gets to see the overview of everything that's happening there as well. So the proposal, relatively straightforward. Um, what's the contents of the book going to be? Who are the people that are involved? Who are the, the target audience? How would you try to market it? You know, those types of things. So we finally submit the proposal. It goes off, it gets reviewed and it comes back. And then there's, there's feedback with that as well. Um, and, and there's an opportunity then to, to update and kind of tighten it. I, I've been very lucky. Um, everything has been um, accepted, but I, I think the, the key to that has been the level of engagement at the proposal stage. It wasn't a case of me going off and writing something and then submitting it and coming back with a review, but rather sharing it, understanding what makes sense and, and developing the proposal over time so that, that it actually gets to the point where, where it's going to be valuable. Um, once, once it was accepted in, in terms of contract negotiation, there wasn't much negotiation really. There, there's the book processing fee. And as uh, Molly said as well, like, you know, it, it, the terms and conditions are fairly straightforward, they're fairly standard. Um, from, from the point of view of, of an author here, the works that I've published as open access, they've always been funded by a funder uh, that wants to have open access research. So, so it's very much a push from the funder. Yes, we want to do this. I sit in an institution here, National University of Ireland in Galway. The institute itself wants to be open access as well. So there's a push from the institution and my salary is paid for by, by, by taxpayers. So I'm quite happy for my work to, to go out and open access as well. So a lot of those things are aligned. Um, and, and, and because of the work being um, collaborative in nature in terms of multiple parties, um, the, the um, open access work, the open access books are quite um, suitable to that as well, because it allows you to, to look at independent chapters that have maybe a coherent narrative or coherent structuring between them, or to have a compendium that's maybe more of a long, long narrative form uh, between it. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, book uh, proposal stage, at least anyway, and, and the negotiations. So now um, I'll give you an opportunity to spill the dirt on Ralph and how it was working with him as an editor for um, the, the editing and revision process. And also, um, just if you could say a little bit about the total timeline, I think Ralph mentioned three to five months. I'm not sure if that's from the proposal to final product, um, but if you could also uh, touch on that too. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so, so, so once, once we, we create the book, we, 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 um, we send it in to Ralph. So, so it's not just Ralph that there's a team, there's a team at Springer that are checking it at the different stages. Um, and, and, any comments we've ever gotten back is always about trying to improve the quality. So whether it's the quality of images or the text or anything else, it's all 
uh, quality driven. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I, I haven't had any issues with it. In, in terms of, of the timeline, um, my optimism always says nine months. Um, the reality is, is that the writing process takes longer. Whether if you're writing it yourself as the primary author, it can, to me, it still takes nine months to, to write a book, no matter how, how much you have in advance. And if you're doing, a, we'll say, a, a contributed um, book with multiple contributions to multiple authors, that can take longer again, because there's a lot of process of, of getting the chapters, reviewing them ourselves so that, as editors, and then bringing them together and, and, and shipping it. Um, so I would say anything from from nine to twelve months. My experience of, of trying to put something together. In in terms of the proposal, um, to be honest, probably a month turnaround time from when we submitted to Rob. Maybe even faster on some occasions. Um, and then when we submitted the the final version, yeah, I, I would say probably three between three and six months, um, depending on how busy things are. Obviously, COVID have, has affected this as well in the last couple of years. So we have to be mindful of that as well. Everything has gotten slower. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a positive experience from, from my point of view and, and straightforward as well. Um, so I wanted to touch on, uh, something that just selfishly is near and dear to my heart, which is, uh, around rights clearances for images and, and other things. I'm, I'm wondering, I don't know how heavily you relied on images or tables. Um, but I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that process and what worked and or didn't and what you found challenging. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a, it's, it's a very important one. Um, so, so for the majority of the material that we've published, we've created ourselves. So, so we've been the, the rights holders and, and, and so that's been relatively straightforward. Um, in, in one of my books, we did reuse some images from other, from other works. Um, some of those we were the copyright holders. Other ones were actually copyright holders from from uh, other um, other authors, and we used. I want to get. I hope I get this right. It's the copyright clearinghouse is it? Copyright the, the, clearance center. That's it. The copyright clearance center. So so once you engage with that process, I actually found it, at least for what I was trying to do, very very straightforward. Um, you have either images or maybe small small pieces of text you've identified. And when you engage with that, everything was, was relatively straightforward for me to be able to get the, the, the permissions to be able to, to reproduce um, those images. But I, I would emphasize we've only maybe seven or eight types of, of images that we've reused across all of the books. So it's, it's quite limited, at least in, in my area, but I found that very straightforward, easy to use, and it didn't raise any issues. And maybe um, Molly in Q&A, maybe that's something you can um, pick up on too. Um, and I will also ask you a hard question about uh, the, the view on fair use or, or fair dealing as well. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, Edward, if, if you have thoughts or reflections on the fact that your books are now open access. I, I don't know if you get questions from people um, or um, if, if there are perceptions you want to address, but how do you just generally feel about them being open access now? Yes, yeah, so, so, so for the type of things that we're doing, so I'm a scientist, uh, this is, um, I'm, my, my research is paid for by, by, uh, by the public, I'm, I'm paid for by the taxpayer. So for me to be able to release um, our work, our collective work here um, as open access is really important. And also the fact that we're looking at books is we're not looking at the traditional audience that you'd have which are scientific journals, but you're looking at are, are trying to create uh, chapters or, or, or books that are more accessible to the general audience, maybe to practitioners. So it really gives us a, a very positive way to be able to disseminate the work that we do. Um, and it also, as, as has been highlighted, when you look at the download numbers that are associated with the works, it, it's very gratifying. So, so our first book is from 2016, it's almost 700,000 download, downloads for the chapters. I haven't seen that in any of my journal articles. Now I've got you know nice nice numbers of citations on journal articles, and that's nice and everything. But I'm pretty sure there's, there's no, no one has downloaded the articles that much, um, which is which is really good from the point of view of, of trying to reach a different audience with that message. Um, we've also seen that the books chapters have been cited uh, in policy documents uh, by different ministries, by the European Commission, by different governments around the world, and that really kind of shows the reach and the impact that we can have. So, so it's it's a complementary channel to traditional journal and conference-based publications that allows us to, to understand, you know, over a body of work, what are we trying to say or what's the key messages, and then being able to target that 
to, to different stakeholders that we would traditionally have with just our journals or our conferences. So, so for us, I think we're very, very proud of that book as a collective. Um, I'm proud of all the books um, that we have. Um, just to, to kind of highlight, the first one is very much a collaborative project between you know, um, 15, 16 different authors. My, my second book was actually just my own research group here together. We, we, we basically captured the work we've done over the last seven or eight years. And then the, the latter books are actually trying to capture the outcomes that we have from, from a program of European projects. So the European Commission have funded about 55 different projects in the area of data technologies. And what we wanted to do was to offer ways of being able to bring together all of the outputs of those projects into a coherent set of books. So we, we actually developed three different books that looked at different aspects of the technologies that were being developed there. So the first one is, you know, collaborative project between, um, between peers. The next one is very much of our, our research group. And the other three are about that collection of projects across, sorry, the, the collection of, of contributions across a program of projects, which kind of shows the, the, the variety that you can actually do when it comes to open access books and being able to engage different types of content um, and, and bringing together different types of communities to do that. I'm really glad that you highlighted the um, the access to different communities um, because it, we're not just talking about um, scholarly uses necessarily. It's, it's used in the public sector for by governments and um, and different agencies. Um, so I, I'm glad that you're seeing that as, as well. Um, last question for you is, you're such a prolific author, How? what advice would you give to someone um, who is getting started with book publishing and um, is considering the process, you know, how would you, what do you wish you would have known um, at it before you, you published your first book? It, it takes longer than you think. <laughs> It takes a lot of work. My, my, my advice would be is to invest as much upfront in, in understanding the story that you want to tell, you know, and, and plan out your book as much as possible. And, and don't do that in isolation, but rather engage with your editor, share those ideas, because the earlier you do that, the more feedback you can get about what would make a good book, what, what will be interesting for readers. It's, it's not the same as a scientific journal where you, you have your results and you're trying to present your results in a in a way that's um, um, that's clear to the to the audience, the journal. When you're looking at a book, you, you are looking at different types of, of readers with a different type of purpose. Um, so I would highly uh, encourage you to engage your editor to, to get that feedback early in the process, and then plan it as much as you can, uh, so that you understand what, what work you need to do ahead. Great. So I am going to turn things back over to Natalie and Katie to handle any questions. Um, you can also ask me questions if you have any specifically about the UC Berkeley book agreement, um, but otherwise I'm sure most of your questions will be for uh, the panelists today. Thank you. Except Molly, I have a question for you though about the um, <laughs> the, the uh, rights clearance issues and, and Springer's willingness to, um, to encourage fair use. Yeah, I think um, I think this is actually a key difference that I often forget about because I'm, I'm only based in HSS publishing between HSS and STM. Rights are a huge, um, a huge part of what we do when we're considering what to publish um, a number. So in my subject area, literature authors inevitably are quoting at, at some length from novels, from other artistic works in cultural studies, you might want to include stills from films. Um, so it is it is really worth thinking about what you need to include in your book. Um, in general, we advise including the smallest amount of third party material possible to in order for you to get your argument across. Um, for open access books, all the more so just because they're that much more visible. So from for the books that I work on, fair use is 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 definitely something that we recognize. Um, we expect authors, we have guidance on our website actually, uh, there's information on our third party um, permissions policy and it outlines something that we call a copyright exception. And that explains, uh, it explains some of the kind of the background of fair use. Fair use is, is really tricky because there is no legal definition of what constitutes fair dealing. And particularly when your book has the chance to be read 
and accessed by so many more people and by the by the original rights holder just like that uh, it is something that we take really seriously so for text I think it's often easier to demonstrate how something is integral for the purposes of criticism and review but we would be very very cautious um, with any image material for those we'd really want you to seek permission um, uh, from the rights holder and we can give a lot of support in the wording and, and how to handle those permissions requests because often often with galleries or with um, archives they might not be as familiar with open access and uh, there's far fewer instances of images that are created by authors for our books. Thank you. Oh, Ralph, uh, go go ahead. Yeah, I'm... yeah uh, I, I just wanted to add a little bit. I think the, the situation is, um, I dare say, not as difficult in uh, at least in computer science and I dare say in most uh, hard sciences as uh, for Molly in, in HSS, because uh, there are usually no uh, longer citations or say really literal citations of text. Uh, the main issue in, in the hard sciences is usually with some figures that may have been published before, oftentimes in uh, journals, for example. And uh, I'm lucky to say, I mean, all the publishers, with respect to this, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, I mean, everyone's uh, publishing uh, books and everyone relies on the fact that uh, now and then he may need to reuse a figure that originally was published with another publisher. So I dare say among the scientific publishers, uh, the exchange most of the time uh, runs rather easily as Edward also has uh, pointed out. There are, there may be only exceptions, then, then we're probably closer to what Molly had mentioned. For example, uh, we have books in uh, cultural computing where there are photographs of some historic sites or uh, some historic maps, et cetera, uh, where the copyright is with some museum, for example, yeah, then it may get difficult. But I dare say in most cases, I'm happy to say that in the hard sciences and computer science, it's not that much of a problem. Rachel, you asked an interesting question actually in the chat to the, the hosts and um, panelists about how you actually go about finding your editor to begin with. Um, so I think I think the 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 best thing to say really is that it's it's not difficult. You can please reach out to us. We are here, we, we want to hear from you. Um, so there is a list of all of the editors that work for both Palgrave and Springer on our website. I can put the link in the chat. Oh, you're muted now. You're muted. Sorry, I don't know why that happened. Was I muted the whole time? Okay. Um, uh, so I've just put a link in the chat that shows all of the um, Palgrave and Springer editors. So really get in touch with us. We love to hear from authors. Uh, there's ways of filling in forms on the website if you're really not sure who to contact. But if you do contact multiple editors, just, just copy the other people in so that so that they know that you're in touch as well and we'll figure out who, who you should speak with. Um, equally, if you're at a conference and you have the chance to speak to somebody in person, uh, we, we are there because we want to hear about your book projects and we want to know what's happening in the wider world. So please don't feel hesitant about coming up and, and just approaching an editor and seeing if they might be interested in your project. Other questions? Okay, since there aren't any questions, maybe I can pose one. Um, would any of you like to comment on um, how to get funding for your open access publication. You could sign an agreement like we signed, and then all of the authors affiliated with your institution will be able to, to have their book published. Yeah, maybe I can say a 
few words um, from, again, from the computer science perspective. I think so far, I mean, as Molly had mentioned, say uh, the world uh, moves on in different pace. Yeah? Uh, we have seen the OA movement, I dare say, starting in Europe with the requirements of the European Commission. And, and that's also why most of the open access books we've published so far are actually coming out of Europe. In uh, computer science, we also have seen that sometimes some large companies are interested to fund some specific research and to see that the results then are later widely distributed. Uh, the US from our perspective is still at an earlier stage, but we see that it's uh, say now progressing and uh, I can well imagine that in maybe two to three years time, you've probably reached the uh, Europe, Europe so then. Yeah, thank you. If I could just add to that as well, what we've seen over the last few years is, is the notion of building open access fees into your grant applications as well. So, so recognizing that at the end of this, we're gonna to want to publish open access and then having a certain amount of fee set aside at the application stage. And I will just um oh, sorry, and I was on. just oh sorry, Rachel, go ahead. I, oh, I was just going to add um and in HSS where it's a lot less likely, especially in the U.S., to be grant funded. Um, I, I think in general it's important to have conversations with your research office and your library about what funding sources could be available um, and starting uh, to think about, you know, I, I said it kind of cheekily about the, um, the agreement, but in HSS funding really isn't available and book processing charges are, you know, far great, far higher than they are for journal publishing. So um, unless your institution at least here is committed to repurposing subscription or um, or collection funds to start supporting uh, open access book publishing. Then um, you know that funding might not be available. I will say some um, open access book publishers have a waiver program or a grant program um, that will allow because of the the book publishing charges received from paying authors, um, they factor in enough to spill over into um, kind of a, a, a waiver program or a grant uh, program for authors from um, institutions or countries that don't have uh, funding. And so that is another um, equity driven opportunity for people to, to publish books in HSS. I'm sorry, Molly. Go ahead. No, I was I was gonna say I was gonna say almost the same thing. It's it's just really important to speak to your librarian because they are very well versed on what is available to you. And there might be opportunities that you are just not aware of at your institution yet, like this partnership. Um and even I think just just making sure that librarians are hearing from HSS authors that they want to publish open access and that this matters and is important to them. It really helps them to build a case as well when, when they are having conversations about budget. Um, we also have a, a free author funding support service at Springer Nature. So there is a list of different funders by country and different um, uh, companies as well on our, on our site. And if you get in touch with an editor, they can also talk to the funding team just in case there might be some extra um, opportunities to apply for funding or to if one of your co-authors may be based at a European institution where there is more of a tradition of um, having open access funding, that can be another route in too. Any other questions from anyone? Well, I, I have to say, I'm so grateful to all of you. I know it's late where you are, um, and uh, this has been really helpful um, for, for everyone, for us, for, for everyone who attended. So thank you so much. Um, we look forward to 
publishing more open access books. Um, so please keep them coming and, and please, um, you know, if there's anything we can do to, to work with you to, uh, to get in touch with authors um, and to have good dialogues, we're, we're always happy to do that. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, and uh, we will talk to you soon. We'll be posting this video on our YouTube site. So um, thanks very much. Okay, thank you and goodbye. Thanks.